Ultimately, only as we begin to value what we do as architects, will our clients begin to value what we do. Business of Architecture UK, episode 161. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, I will be your host today, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today, we're gonna to continue the conversation that we started last week on how to communicate the value of architecture. And I wanna ask you a question. Are you being compensated both in recognition and money for the enormous value you bring to the table as an architect? Do your clients clearly recognize your value? Can they articulate it? Can you articulate it? Often, there's a misalignment between the perception that we have as architects and our clients in terms of the value of our services. And this is a basic question. Our services are valuable, but how valuable are they? And how much of that value are you capturing? It isn't uncommon for design professionals to have their fees questioned and examined by clients, to be price shopped and to be competing based upon price alone. Now, what this does for architecture is actually pretty disastrous because it creates a working pressure that decreases the quality of work and creative innovation that firms are able to do. Because let's face it, if we're at the end of the job and we want to continue to deliver an excellent product, but we're out of fee, this becomes very difficult, not to mention the stress and business problems that it causes in other areas of the practice. So ultimately, any commercial transaction is a transaction of value. There's value being exchanged. Each party exchanges something for something they perceive to be of greater value. Now, often we think of value exchange in terms of money, in terms of currency, but what I'd have you consider is that money is just a representation of value. It's not value itself. So the question then is, what is value? Let's consider this, that money itself has no inherent value. It only has the perception of value. This is why we see currency exchanges fluctuating. This is why we see the stock market going up and down. This is why we see inflation or deflation. Because ultimately, the value of a currency or money or the value of the, ex the medium of exchange that we use, economists teach us, is it depends 100% on the confidence that people have in that money. Now, how do we apply this to architectural services? Well, when we look at this reasoning, it informs us on how to position, describe, and value architectural services when we communicate with our potential clients and with our clients. And when we understand this, when we understand what truly is value and how do we communicate it to our clients, we realize that, again, value is not a fixed construct, but it's something that can be molded. It can be influenced and shaped. So today we're going to continue the conversation that we had last week on how to communicate the value of architecture. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Last week, we went over the value equation. We talked about what value is. We talked about, and we came to the conclusion that value is a subjective mental construct, and as such, it can be influenced. So this is the first important point to realize, because oftentimes when we're communicating with clients, we see value as something that's fixed. In other words, we see that, well, the client has a certain perception of value. We have a certain perception of value. Now we have to come to the table and come to some sort of agreement. But what I'd have you consider is that there's there's an element of being able to not, pers not, not necessarily convince, but persuade and open up a client's mind to have them perceive the value of architectural services that you provide. Now, how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to enter into a conversation um, that ranges from everything from psychology to behavioral economics. And we're going to end up with some very clear, specific strategies for how to communicate the value of architecture. These are not theoretical. They're tried and true. They work. We're going to start out with theory, and then we're going to end up with some applicable strategies. 
Behavioral economists have shown that have long shown that the perception of value is subjective. So let's go back to Richard Thaler. He was a recipient of the 2017 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. And in 1983, he demonstrated a theory called the theory of transaction utility. I'm going to explain what this is. Here's the theory of transaction utility. Imagine you're lying on the beach on a hot day. All you have to drink is ice water. For the last hour, you've been thinking about how much you would enjoy a nice cold bottle of your favorite brand of beer. A companion gets up to make a phone call and offers to bring back a beer from the only nearby place where beer is sold. He says that the beer might be expensive and so asks how much you're willing to pay for the beer. He says that he will buy the beer if it costs as much or less than the price that you state. But if it costs more than the price you state, he won't buy it. Now, you trust your friend, and there's no possibility of bargaining with the vendor. What price do you tell him? This is the hypothetical scenario. So Thaler told this story to survey participants in two variations. In the version one of the story, the beer vendor was a small, rundown grocery store. And in the second version of his story, the beer vendor was a fancy resort hotel. Okay, so the only thing that's shifting in this hypothetical story that Thaler was telling the survey participants was the environment in which the beer is being sold. Now, here's what's interesting. When Thaler presented these hypothetical scenarios to survey participants, he found people were willing to pay 76% more for a beer from the fancy resort hotel than from the small rundown grocery store. Okay? People were willing to pay 70%, 76% more for a beer from the fancy resort hotel than from the small, rundown grocery store. In this example, the successful outcome is the same in both versions of the story. What you ultimately get is you get to drink a cold bottle of beer on the beach. And yet, people are willing to pay substantially more for an identical item. Now, this might beg the question for you, how is your firm being perceived? Are you perceived as a small rundown grocery store or are you perceived as the fancy resort hotel or are you somewhere in between? Now, this example and many other research studies by economic scientists show that a consumer's behavior depends not solely on price, but also the consumer's perception of the financial terms of the quality of the financial terms of the deal. So consider that. Consider that a consumer's behavior, in this case we're speaking of our architectural clients, that their behavior doesn't depend solely on price. So what does it depend on? According to this research, it isn't what you charge, but it's how those charges are presented that has the greatest impact on how clients perceive your value. Let's move over to another concept, a theory of economics that's been debunked it's called the labor theory of value so the question then is okay how do we value our architectural services do we value them based upon um, in our world do we value them based upon the number of hours that we spend the effort that we put into it do we base it upon the experience that we have in the past do we value it based upon the unique solution that we bring to the table do we value it based upon the resumes or the experience of our team members probably a combination of all these now the labor theory of value is an economic concept. Let's talk about it. The labor theory of value states that the value of a commodity can be objectively measured by the average number of labor hours required to produce that commodity. In other words, in simplified terms, what the labor theory of value says, uh, because I need, my, my slow brain needs to simplify this. The labor theory of value basically says that the value of something is tied to how many hours it takes to produce it. Does this sound familiar? For years and years and years and decades, this is the frame that we've been operating as, as architects, which is oftentimes, even though we may not present our fees that way, ultimately, when you look back at how most architecture firms, how most of us are structuring our fees, most often it goes back to an idea about how much time or how much effort we're putting to the pro into the project. This is how we end up pricing our services. And right here, I'm using value and pricing interchangeably. So when we set our fees, oftentimes what we're basically falling back on is what economists would call the labor theory of value, which is that the fees we're charging directly correlate to the number of hours we spend producing our product. So in our experience, 
as architects and also working with architects, we found that it's very, very common and it's almost the established norm in the industry to put a monetary value on our services based upon the number of labor hours that are required to produce those services. However, the labor theory of value has been discredited by modern economists as an efficient mechanism for evaluating value. Huh, interesting. Economists have debunked the idea of the labor theory of value, meaning that they've, they've clearly stated and shown that it is not an efficient mechanism for evaluating the value. The principle here is that the labor required to produce architectural services ultimately has no fixed correlation to the value of those services. Uh, the labor required to produce architectural services has no correlation to the fixed value of those services. Now, this completely blew my mind when I understood it. Because when you detach the value of architecture and what architects can charge from the labor required to produce those services, the entire conversation changes and new things become possible. Now, here's just a simple example to illustrate this point. Let's say that a decent, a decent smartphone retails for a thousand pounds, yet the labor and materials required to produce that phone equals 75 pounds. What we can clearly see here is that the labor hours required to produce the phone has little to do with the value of the phone. And if we look further at how the phone is used, keeping in touch with connections, closing business deals, navigating with GPS, finding my way around the city, communicating in an emergency, and more, we can easily see that the value that we as individuals receive from a smartphone is many, 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 many times the cost of acquiring the phone. So we can see here that in this sense, the labor required to produce the phone is not an efficient means for valuing how valuable that phone is to me as an individual. Now, if the labor theory of value is an inefficient means for determining the monetary value of architectural services, this then leads us to the question, what then is a more efficient and effective way for measuring this value? We're going to move on to what's called the subjective theory of value. Subjective theory of value was created independently by William Stanley uh, Jevons, Leon Walrus, and Carl Menger in the late 19th century. What it basically states is this, that the value of an object is not fixed by the labor nor the resources required to produce it. Instead, what they showed is that value is variable according to the context and the perception of the consumer. In other words, value is in the eye of the beholder. For instance, someone dying of thirst in a desert will place a very high value on a glass of water. Since value is subjective, and the perception of value varies from person to person, we see that there is no one true yardstick that we can put forth to measure value. This principle applies wherever a value exchange occurs, including an exchange of value in architectural services. This leads us to another concept called the price elasticity of demand. In economic terms, the price elasticity of demand measures how much demand for an item decreases as the price for that item increases. So if you've ever found that when you raise your fee, you may lose the project or you worry about losing the project with a certain fee, you're experiencing the effects of the price elasticity of demand. Products and services which, have, which are readily available and have abundant substitutes will experience a higher price elasticity of demand meaning that an increase in price will result in lower demand. Now this is the world oftentimes we inhabit as architects as we feel that the price elasticity of demand of architectural services is very high, meaning that when we put together the fee that we think it's gonna require, when we estimate the fee to be able to do the job properly, oftentimes this fee in our own eyes looks very large. And what's common is for us to begin mentally discounting the fee and thinking, already playing out the conversation in our head that our clients are going to tell us this is too much money. They'll balk at the fee. They'll be upset. Perhaps they won't even want to use this and they'll go with a cheaper competitor. This is a sign of being subject to a high price elasticity of demand. Now, the inverse is also true. A product or service that is perceived as unique, differentiated, scarce, and valuable will have a low price elasticity of demand. In other words, with a low price elasticity of demand, buyers are willing to pay more for an item. The good news is that the price elasticity of demand can be influenced by us because the, price, the, the perception of value occurs in the mind of our prospects and our clients. So behavioral economics teaches us that, again, how we present our fee is more important than the fee itself in a successful proposal. 
In his book, How Customers Think, Essential Insights into the Mind of the, the Market, Harvard Business School professor emeritus Gerald Zaltman stated that 95% of our purchase decisions take place in the subconscious mind. The primary way the subconscious mind communicates with the conscious mind is through emotions. Now, this isn't to say that our emotional decision-making process is flawed, but what are we saying here? What we're saying here is that although we'd like to think that our clients and our prospects and our potential clients are making rational decisions when they're evaluating our service as architects, what we find is that this is not the case. What we find is that it is an emotionally driven decision, hmm. driven by the subconscious mind. There was a very interesting study called the Iowa Gambling Task Study that suggests how our subconscious mind not only operates, but also that it's much more capable of making advantageous decisions than we give it credit for. So I remember when I first heard this concept that as human beings, what we really do is we really make decisions emotionally and then we justify them with logic. I thought, well, that's not very good. I don't want to make decisions emotionally. I want to make decisions logically. I feel a bit flawed here as a human being. But what I've since learned and what the Iowa gambling study actually suggests is that actually these emotional decisions that we make can actually be more astute, more rapid, and more beneficial than what we might do uh, logically. Let's move on to what the study showed us. So in this study, the participants were given a sim simulated computer game with an imaginary budget and four stacks of cards. So imagine four stacks of cards. The purpose of the game was to win as much money as possible by drawing cards from any of the four decks. Okay, so you have four decks of cards there. You draw cards, and then the cards are going to have say certain things, and you're going to win, win money. Participants, what they were not aware of is that two of the decks were losing decks, meaning two of the decks were rigged to be, have overall losses, and then two of the decks were overall winners. What's really interesting from this study is that they, they hooked up participants to monitors. And what they found is that participants became nervous when reaching for the risky deck after drawing only 10 cards, although it took them about 50 cards to stop drawing from the risky decks and about 80 cards to logically explain why. Imagine that. So after only 10 cards, their emotions were already telling them and giving them a warning although it took them 50 cards to stop drawing from the risky decks, and it ultimately took them 80 cards to logically explain why. In an article for the Harvard Business Review, Michael D. Harris writes, We now understand that our unconscious decisions follow a logic of their own. They're based on deeply empirical mental processing system that is capable of effortlessly producing millions of bits of data without getting overwhelmed. I mean, this is just incredible. This is incredible when you think about the power of the human mind, not just consciously, but subconsciously, to be able to make empirical decisions. Not just random and illogical decisions, irrational decisions, but actual empirical mental processing decisions after processing millions of bits of data without getting overwhelmed. Just incredible. So we like to think that our clients make logical and rational purchasing decisions when it comes to determining the value of architectural services. However, behavioral economics teaches us that this isn't the case. And I found this to, that this isn't the case too through my own experience. The key here is that the subconscious processes ultimately drive the perception of value. Now let's talk about intrinsic value versus intrinsic extrinsic value there's two kinds of values when we're talking about how we value our services and how this relates to the the fees that we might put forth to a client intrinsic value is the value of something in and of itself for instance we'll define intrinsic value as the utility of a product a service or experience for practical and functional purposes for example the intrinsic value of a car is that it gets us from point a to point b in safety the extrinsic value of a product, service, or experience is the extra value determined by the perceptions of society and, and us as individuals. For example, the extrinsic value of a Rolls Royce is status and significance that one would get from driving such a vehicle. Okay, this is going to be in, in contrast to a Ford Focus. Right? They both get us from point A to point B, but there's a, a lot of value put onto the Rolls Royce versus the Ford. This is extrinsic value. Extrinsic factors have a multiplying effect on the perceived value of a product, service, or experience. So when we look at architectural services and how we influence the value, the perception of value of our services, what we find is that there's two ways to add value. There's 
we need to look at both intrinsically and extrinsically, the extrinsic value. What I'd have you consider is that the key to being able to influence and boost and increase the perception of value of your clients is going to lie in the extrinsic value that your, your, your services are perceived as. So the key here to communicating the value of architectural services to a potential client is to align the description of your services, how you present, again, remember, that how you present your fees has a greater impact on the behavior of your potential clients than, um, than the fee itself. So what we, what we find out here is that what we need to do is we need to align the description or the presentation of our services with the client's internal perception of value. Does this make sense? It's much easier to be able to figure out what the client values and then see if that matches what we provide as architects. Now, if it doesn't match, then it's not a fit and we're, more, we're, we're ethically obligated to tell them to go, to go elsewhere to find a service. But if there is a match, then we're, again, we're ethically obligated to be able to help them understand and see the value. The first step in aligning the presentation of your services with your client's internal perception of value is, first of all, uncovering what is their internal perception of value. So how do we do this? How do we discover what our clients actually value? Because oftentimes if we ask them what they value, they won't be able to tell us. Not so this comes with experience, but I'm going to give you a framework. Sigmund Freud famous psychologist developed what's called the pain pleasure principle. What this principle suggests is that people make choices to avoid pain or gain pleasure. So people are motivated by two things. Number one, avoiding pain or number two, gaining pleasure. So what we know here is that a client's internal perception of value will be related to either avoiding loss or gaining a pleasurable outcome. And Economist Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky first coined the term called loss aversion. Now, loss aversion is an idea or a tendency that people have to protect, protect against a loss rather than achieve a gain. What this basically says is that people are more motivated to prevent pain, to avoid pain, than to gain a pleasure. Sad but true. This study has been reaffirmed by more recent studies, including a 2020 study led by Kai Ruggieri, which you can look up on the internet. Um, Columbia Mailman School of Public Health um, was this study replicating patterns of prospect theory for decisions under risk. Now, behavioral economics teaches us then that loss aversion is a more powerful motivator than gain. So a clue here, as you're looking about how to communicate the value of architecture, one of the areas that you should be looking at is how are you preventing loss in your client's world? How does the architectural services, the buildings, the projects that you create, how do they prevent loss? How do they keep your clients from risking something, from losing something, from losing money, other areas? Now, your value is seen through the eyes of your prospect, has a direct correlation to the respect, the prestige, and the money that you earn and that you're given as an architect. So the question then becomes, okay, how do we maximize our value the value of our services in the minds of our prospective and current clients. What we talked about is this idea of aligning the, our value with the perception of our client's value. As we just finished discussing, people value things that help them avoid loss and pain or gain a reward and pleasure. Pains can be current pains that will be solved or fears that future pains will be avoided. So there's two kind of two ways we can look at this here. For example, I'm going to use a residential example here in terms of residential architecture. Uh, a current pain is that I don't like the layout of my bedroom and my bathroom. Now, this may be due to a number of things. I can speak from my own experience. In the house that we live in now, it's a beautiful mid-century modern house, but there's a number of architectural faux pas that really get under my skin. One of them is that when I'm standing in my shower, so as I've taken a shower, I like to leave the door, the door to my bathroom open because I like the airflow. I don't like it to fog up in there. I'll open up a window, but I just, I don't really like closing doors. Something, I don't know. It's just a personal preference. In any case, when my bathroom door is open <laughs> and when my bedroom door is open, someone who's going down the hallway and passing the bedroom door can see him. Because of the way the mirror is positioned in the bathroom, as you pass the entry door to my bedroom and you look and you glance, you're directly looking at the shower. <laughs> 
<laughs> and this this happened just last week when I was getting out of the shower. I was standing actually I was standing in my bedroom. And sorry sorry for the mental imagery. I was completely butt naked. So I'm standing there looking in the mirror, and then I see my teenage son is like walking back, and he pauses and he looks at me, and he he was just embarrassed. He's all sorry. I said, oh sorry about that, son. And I closed the door. So this is an example for me. This is one thing that once my wife and I are looking to remodel our house. So this is a pain for me. The layout of our bedroom is a pain. The layout of our bathroom is a pain. And more specifically, the, ex the exact pain is the fact that when I take a shower, I like to leave the door open, but someone walking past my bedroom, if a guest were to come over and my bedroom door is open, they would probably have more information than they wanted to see, right? So this is an example of a current pain that we're experiencing. Let's look at the second kind of pain, which would be a future pain. A future pain would be fear that a project might go over budget, perhaps that we'll pay too much for it, and perhaps even deplete our funds. So let's look at some other examples of potential pains. Fear of costly building mistakes. Fear of not hitting important deadlines or timeframes. Fear of embarrassment or loss of reputation. And often this last one is the biggest motivator for our clients. Now, let's talk about a hypothetical situation here to illustrate this principle. Let's say that there's a husband and a wife couple. They want to do a whole house remodel. In their conversations with an architect, they discuss their preferences and how they want to live. They talk about natural light, connection to the exterior, etc. The architect probes further and discovers a key motivator. The current home's layout, so after, after digging and after careful, active listening, the architect discovers that at the core of the motivation of why this couple wants to remodel the house. First of all, the wife is the one who's driving the mo uh, driving the remodel. She's the one who wants it to happen. And ultimately, what's happened is that uh, they've recently gotten married and that in the wife's mind, the layout of the house is linked to the ex-wife. Okay. Now, normally as architects, we might miss this critical piece of information, but this architect was listening very carefully and this architect noticed that there was some linking here. So ultimately, what the architect realized is that this wife, she wants a new home for a new beginning. Now, because of this, the couple go with the architect who deeply understands their motivation. The other architects were talking about space, about their experience, about how their design approach goes. But this architect, because of careful listening, was able to discover that there was a pain that the wife, that the woman in this experience wanted to avoid. And the pain was walking home or into a house every single day that reminded her of her husband's previous marriage. Okay, let's move on to example B. We're gonna move on to, that was a residential example. For those of you that don't do residential architecture, let's move on to an institutional example. So let's say that a facility manager at a regional hospital has been given the task of selecting an architecture firm to overhaul the hospital's cardiac surgery suite. Now during the project interview, the design team discovers that a key emotional motivator is that the facility manager wants to avoid embarrassment in front of the hospital CEO and board. This is the case. If you work for any organization, you know that oftentimes they're political and what people are looking to do is they're looking to protect their own interests. They're looking to protect their image. They're looking to protect their job. Nothing wrong with that. Embarrassment could be due to delayed project schedules, design mistakes, or cost overruns. The design team presents how they will address each of these issues, managing the project schedule, avoiding design errors and cost overruns. These solutions are presented in the context of avoiding embarrassment. Now, oftentimes, if you're a smaller architecture firm, you may have even heard from a client that we went with another firm because they were larger, right? Why oftentimes does this happen? Well, there may be many reasons, but one of the reasons why is because the people who are choosing the architecture firms are going with the more sure bet. They're going with the firm that they feel has less risk of embarrassment, less risk of failure. Because if you're a facility manager or employee who's working for one of these companies, what you're most interested in is not being the person that made a terrible decision. All right. So again, if you're in one of these conversations, you know this is something you're going to have to address and overcome. So let's talk about an exercise. To align your value with the perception of your client's value, uh, your client's perception of value first. Step number one, discover the pains the client is trying to avoid. Okay, so you're actually going to go through this exercise. Write down, do a brainstorm, and even have an initial interview if that's possible with the client. Try to figure out, okay, what are the pains that they're trying to avoid? Both the current pains they're experiencing as well as the future pains that they could possibly experience that they want to avoid. 
That's step number one. Step number two is what is the pleasure or the reward the client is seeking? So what are the positives that they're trying to seek in the world? For instance, suppose a hospital wants to add more patient beds so it can increase revenue, provide better, better service. This would be the positive. This would be the pleasure. The inverse would be that the hospital wants to avoid bad publicity about not having enough beds for sick patients and putting patients in the hallways to handle the overflow and capacity as we've seen during this COVID crisis. So for each of your prospective clients' projects, identify the following. Number one, the pain or the problem that's being avoided. Number two, the pleasure or reward that's being sought. Now, oftentimes, the clients won't even necessarily know what the exact pain is that they're trying to avoid. This is where it gets tricky. Then they might not actually know the real pleasure or reward that they're seeking. They may think they do, but this is where your job as a professional comes in to be able to uncover this and help them to see it. Number three, Identify what is the specific process, the specific strategy, or the solution that your firm uses to address that particular, each particular pain and each particular pleasure. Okay, so let me give you an example here. Number one, we might talk about a pain or a problem. Our current home is uninspiring and dated. Owners feel frustrated with many aspects of current design. The pleasurable reward. Owners want to feel uh, feel like they're in a new, hip, and successful. They want to feel new, hip, and successful, and they want a home to reflect this aspiration. In other words, they want to feel they want to feel like the masters of their universe. They want to feel significant. So the solution. Let's say that we're providing a solution for this. What we do as a firm is we create a vision board of who you aspire to be as a person, so we can design the custom home for this future future, future version of you. Okay, you see how we took we took a pain, we took a pleasure, and then we created a solution around that. All right. So the key to capturing more value for your architectural services is ultimately creating a win-win solution. And if a client's emotional reasons for seeking a solution are addressed, they will value the solution you offer to the degree that they want to avoid the pain or the pleasure that you map out. This brings me to uh, another story. Let's give a quick example of this. This is a fictional story, but a merchant ship with a valuable cargo, let's say, was stuck in port due to an engine problem. Multiple mechanics came to look at the ship, and none were able to fix the issue. As a last resort, the ship's engineer contacted a crusty old mechanic who was referred and known for his unconventional ways. The mechanic came with his tools, looked over the engines carefully. He asked the engineer to try to start the engines. And as he walked around them, he listened carefully. Finally, he reached into his worn tool bag and he pulled out a mallet. He put his arm into the recesses of the engine and gave several sharp raps with the mallet. The engineer was amazed when the engines fired up with no sign of the former issue. The mechanic handed the engineer the bill for the repair, which had taken just under an hour. The engineer looked at, down at the bill and exclaimed with surprise, $1,000 for one hour of work? Yes, replied the old mechanic with a wry smile. That's $100 for an hour of my time and $900 for knowing where to tap. Since every hour the ship was in port was costing the company hundreds and hundreds of dollars, the engineer smiled at the wise mechanic and paid the bill. When you successfully align the value of your services with your client's perception of value, you create a win-win for both parties. So as architects, Yes, our time has value, but ultimately the, the, the value that you're bringing to a project is knowing where to tap. When presenting or marketing your services, don't sell features. A feature is what something is, a specific element of your offering or service. So an example of a, of a feature would be something like a specific CAD program or process. We use BIM. We use virtual reality. These are, these are all features. Uh, experience that you may have as a design firm. We have 35 years of experience. An attribute, we listen to clients or we are client focused. Features can definitely be beneficial in a selling situation, but only when they're directly tied to a specific pain that will be avoided or a pleasure that will be gained. So here's an example. Our design team and consultants use building information modeling, we use BIM, and class detection, which on average we found that it saves our clients 8% of the project budget. Ah. So we're giving them the feature, but then we're actually linking it to avoiding a potential risk in the future, which is loss of money.
So the pain avoided here is spending extra money due to design mistakes and omissions or potential errors, change orders, clashes, etc. The, the, the example here is that instead of selling features, sell the specific solutions that relate to our clients' pains and pleasures. All right, this has been hopefully a valuable episode for you. I know that my mind is struggling to keep up with all these big words that we've gone over here, prospect theory, transactional utility, labor theory, labor theory, value of money, the Iowa gamb task gambling study. Um, but in conclusion, what I'd have you consider today as we wrap up this episode is that your ability to communicate your value lies at the core of your success of being able to do the kind of architecture that you aspire to do. Because let's face it, when we're struggling to make finances meet, when we're operating in a place of worry that we're gonna lose projects or worry that our pipeline will become dry or even taking on so many projects that we have difficulty delivering them, this puts us into a place of overwhelm, struggle, and reactivity as opposed to being able to slowly and confidently guide from the helm and focus on doing the work that we want to do. So what we've learned today is that value is a psychological construct that can be influenced and molded. So the flip side of being overwhelmed and the flip side of trying to put out fires and the flip side of not having enough money and being in a place of, 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 of lack is being in a place of abundance. Being in a place of abundance because we have the ability to communicate very clearly our value. And our mission here at Business of Architecture is to help architects around the world become masterful communicators of their value. Because let's face it, our clients aren't going to do it for us. Uh, no one's coming to save us. And if we're going to turn the tide of this, this, this lack of value in the marketplace and this ignorance around things that are long-term solutions that our clients should be valuing and should be investing in, it's going to come down to us as architects. No one else is going to do it. So as we learn and as, as we're taught through the study of behavioral economics, how a fee is presented has a greater impact on the success of a proposal than the amount, than the actual amount of the fee in that proposal. So the key here to, to maximizing the perception of value of architectural services is to align the services that we provide with the perceived pains and desired pleasures of the clients. What does this look like? When this is working, this looks like a firm where you're empowered and you have the ability to do the creative work that you want. You have the free time, you have the energy, you have the resources to be able to provide deep and valuable service, deep and valuable design quality, deep and innovative designs for your clients. As a result, the whole entire world wins. But it's on us, again, to be able to communicate our value. We can't expect our clients to inherently get our value. That's our job as professionals. So how do we do this? When presenting our proposals for architectural services, focus on the solutions we provide to specific problems, pains, and fears, as well as the desired pleasures and rewards. And of course, this comes through deep listening, through deep understanding, and ultimately through practice. It's a, it's a process of discovery to discover what is the value that we're bringing our clients. Ultimately, only as we begin to value what we do as architects, will our clients begin to value what we do and that is a wrap for our conversation on value today i'd love to get your feedback on today's episode the content we we covered here on communicating your value as an architect we'd appreciate and we'd love to get a feedback or a review over on itunes and we will give you a shout out if you give us a review over there you can head over to itunes and just Give us a review. Let us know what you thought about this episode and the episodes we produce here at Business of Architecture. If you have any recommendations or suggestions for future shows, you can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by getting access to our free 45-minute firm owner masterclass by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by our guests do not represent those of the host, and we make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.